Ti mislil? Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. I thought I'd start off this week. I always try to do something different. Uh, as you know, there well, you may not know this, but there's a lot of stuff going on in the news about the National Institutes of Health budget under pressure. And Eric Topol, uh, who's uh, at the Scripps Clinic, uh, did an interesting analysis of all the drugs that have been developed, uh, and all the new drugs, and what percentage of those are due to science that was supported by the National Institutes of Health. <laughs> that would be in yellow, and the, <laughs> this is the amount that's of new drug development that occurs when it's not NIH funded. So just to point out that when you think about basic science that's supported by the National Institute of Health, it, Institutes of Health, it does develop into the, many of the drugs that treat us. There was also a really, really interesting study in Nature Medicine, <laughs> a little depressing but interesting, that dealt with why we're having such an increase in dementia and Alzheimer's. And just so, <laughs> this is pretty graphic, but this is a normal brain on the right, and that is what my brain looks like on the left. I mean, it, Alzheimer's brain on the left is shrunken and all this protein tangles and all that kind of stuff. So the, this was an interesting study that tried to estimate the burden of dementia in the United States. And it looked at uh, lifetime risk between the ages of 55 and 95 years. And it took the census projections uh, for the United States and tried, based on that data, try to project what will be the likelihood of the incidence of dementia as, as we go towards 2060. And the, the sort of the shocking piece was that they estimated that 42 percent of the population <laughs> will be demented. <laughs> Might be higher than that right now. But uh, so the rates are significantly higher in women, black adults, and those that carry a specific gene, the ApoE Epsilon 4 gene that is known to be the one genetic risk factor for, um, for uh, dementia and, and Alzheimer's. And that is a, a gene that's responsible for cholesterol and lipid transport. But if you carry one or two genes, there's an increasing risk for Alzheimer's. Uh, right now, the number of U.S. adults who develop dementia is projected to increase from about 514,000 in 2020 to 1 million in 2060. And uh, there's concerns about it uh, because of this tremendous burden uh, and as a result, what the, what the paper is recommending, that people start focusing on healthy aging. We should really focus on those risk factors that lead to uh, problems or a higher risk of, of, of uh, dementia. And there are things like nutrition, actually education, activity. There are a lot of things that have a big, import, uh, a big importance. In the study, uh, there were 25 percent that were African American or black. There's a slightly higher incidence uh, in that population of, of, of Alzheimer's and dementia. In the United States, the population is 14 percent. So it could be that the reason it was uh, that there's a higher projection is that, that slight increase in the, in the study patients. Now the explanation is why is it happening? Why is this happening? And I've shown this many times before. If you look at life expectancy in the United States from 1850 on, we've been doing a great job. There's been almost three years per decade in improvement in life expectancy for the last 150 years. And it's been pretty linear except for two dips. One uh, around 60, which was the famine in China involved with the Cultural Re Revolution, and then the dip that was COVID related. But the reason this has been this way is we've had improvements in infectious diseases and in public health in vaccination then uh, cardiovascular disease uh, interventions, and lately cancer. And so we live longer and longer and longer, which is giving us the opportunity to be demented later in life. So obviously that's probably the biggest uh, issue going forward in the next 10 to 20 years. Wanted to catch up what's going on in, uh, with bird flu. Uh, so far there are still 70 cases uh, total. Uh, mostly they've been uh, in dairy, in people taking care of dairy cattle, 41 of those, 24 in poultry farms, and about five where we really aren't clear what the exposure was. It's been a huge impact in animals. I've, I've mentioned this before. 12,700 wild birds uh, have been detected to be positive. Over 168 million poultry. <laughs> Those chickens are really having a tough time with 
bird flu, 995 uh, dairy herds. There was also a recent uh, report of a sheep. And the reason these are important is because the more evidence that there is bird flu in various ma mammal species, it's a greater and greater concern that it'll jump to humans. But this was uh, in uh, the United Kingdom in uh, Yorkshire. There was a farm where they went. There was actually a, a, an outbreak in captive birds, which are things like parrots, lovebirds, canaries that people were keeping. And so they went and it looked at the, the sheep farm, and it turns out one of the ewes was positive, and, that, and it was actually symptomatic. And the, the, <laughs> the patient, or the ewe, had milk that was positive for H5N1, and blood samples that were positive uh, for H5 antibodies, demonstrating that, uh, that that particular sheep had been infected. And the only s clinical sign was mastitis, or in, in inflammation of the breast. Um, they obviously <laughs> culled, as we say, the birds and that particular sheep, and there was nothing else in the rest of the herd. But it, again, makes you concerned that we need to be looking at a number of different domestic farm animals. There was also a really interesting report in the UK that uh, this is an animal I was unaware of, the South American bush dog, cute little thing, <laughs> but they were actually positive. Uh, a bunch of them, 10 of them, showed up positive with H5N1. Uh, they're part of a captive program, a breeding program in England. Uh, and they were just sort of going back, this group of investigators, just going back and looking to see what other animals were infected. And this was from analysis in 2023, but there were 10 of them uh, that were infected, and they thought it was largely due to probably infected wild birds that were in that captive community. So the, the, an interesting study that <laughs> the only reason to be old, this is actually the only benefit, there was a paper that suggests that seniors may be less vulnerable to bird flu, uh, which sort of is reminiscent of the 1918 flu pandemic, uh, where people over the age of 45 or 50 did better than young people. That's because they had been exposed some 40 years before to a similar virus. Well, this may be true also with uh, bird flu. And it, it, this study uh, looked at H5N1 antibodies from individuals that were born between 1927 and 2016. Uh, and they found that antibodies uh, were higher in the older individuals, more co correlated more closely with birth year than age. And so if you were born, uh, uh, you know, in the 20s and 30s, you're more likely to have been exposed to a virus that was similar in that H1N1 and H2N2 some uh, earlier in the 20s and 30s. So the suggestion is that um, older people might be uh, better able to respond and then the reason that's important if there's a pandemic uh, with bird flu, the most important thing would be to vaccinate younger people first. Anyway, interesting study. Measles con <laughs> continues to be on fire in the United States, up to 483 ca cases. Um, most of them are under the age of 19, uh, with 14% being hospitalized. You know, this was the large breakout in 2019. And you can see uh, that was 1,274 cases, and we're up to 483 so far. The vast majority are in Texas, although there are 19 states in total. Uh, and in Texas, we're already uh, up to 422 cases. So it's really been a real problem. There's been one fatality in a school-aged child. If you look at the outbreak in Texas, uh, mostly there are 141 cases under the age of 4, 169 between 5 and 17. And again, if you ever wanted to know the vaccines work, 417 um, were unvaccinated. Only five had exposed, had five of the vaccine. So that's about the what we've said. It's a 97 percent effective. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, there there are many different genotypes um, of uh, measles that are based on the hemagglutin protein and the nuclear protein. So the H and N. The four genotypes that have been circulating since 2018 are B3, D4, D8, and H1. In Texas, the, most of the cases are the D8, or all the cases are the D8 genotype. And the reason that's important, you can then trace where the outbreaks are. So in the 10 cases in New Mexico and the one case in Kansas are of that genotype. So they're almost certainly related to an exposure from Texas cases. In the other eight states, the genotype is B3. So they're probably a different uh, exposure. And again, people are getting exposed when they travel internationally or international people come to the United States. And so probably two different exposures and then, and then uh, outbreaks that were related. So 
Exposure in Texas led to this outbreak in Texas and also New Mexico and probably the one in Kansas. A separate exposure was responsible for the other cases. Uh, and the reason, you know, we continue to be at high risk, there have been three things. The pandemic uh, not only had its issues around making people hesitant to get vaccinated, it also made it difficult for people to get vaccinated. People weren't going to the doctor. So the pandemic actually interrupted a lot of vaccine schedules, but that also induced vaccine hesitancy in many groups. And of course, there's a bunch of people who just don't have access to health care. So when we, you start hearing on the news, oh, they're going to cut Medicaid, Medicaid is one of the ways that we cover people getting vaccinated. Kids get vaccinated. That's covered in Medicaid. So important uh, consideration. Now, my favorite story comes from the NPR because they're now getting all this, these calls in about people, how do you get vaccinated? So suddenly parents have become vaccine enthusiasts. So this is some great. So uh, pediatricians across the country are seeing a huge trend in vaccine enthusiasm. They got our, their call center was inundated with calls about MMR in Broward County, Florida. Patients are, or parents are calling up to see, make sure their kids are all up to date. I'm getting phone calls about what to do about vaccination. So there's nothing like a good outbreak to get people to remind folks, you know, you should get vaccinated. I mean, that's the problem is yeah, people don't see it. So they go, wow, it's a big deal. And now it's a big deal. My guess is you'll see a big uh, increase in the folks that want to get vaccinated. Anyway, I went in today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, uh, we have our educational hackathon happening on May 21st. So anybody in the Baylor community, or I guess outside the Baylor community, anybody who's got a good idea about how we can improve education can compete in the hackathon. There'll be a, a, a URL in the message, and maybe we can put it at the end of the video too. Um, so if you want to participate, you, you can put in your idea. Uh, there is a $25,000 grant at the end to implement your idea, so very exciting about that. Of course, we're in the middle of March Madness uh, this weekend. Big, big games. Four great teams. The first time we've had a number one seeds all along, so it's very exciting. Of course, Duke is playing University of Houston. I must remain neutral, of course, because <laughs> although I went to Duke, uh, I live in Houston and I love U of H. But uh, Lily is not necessarily staying neutral in this. And then, of course, forget that. Most importantly, it's Stat Madness time. So you may recall that last year, Stat Madness is where scientists put in their ideas, and it's a, exactly like the format of March Madness for basketball. And each week, people vote, and the best idea keeps going forward. We won last year on our uh, wastewater analysis to, as a way to uh, look at future uh, emerging pathogens. This year, we're in the finals again with uh, Dr. Ben Deneen's lab on storing and recalling memories. So if you want to help us win, call. It's like Chicago polit politics. Vote early and vote often. You can vote as many times as you want. The better, uh, the more the better. Anyway, uh, there will be a link to that as well uh, in the written thing. Hopefully we'll put that at the end of the video. Yeah. So anyway, have a wonderful weekend. Should be exciting to watch the, the, the uh, final, the final four, or at least the first part of the games. Can't wait to see you next week.